official age, or will you? Uh, whatever you want. I can, yeah, why yeah. don't you say we'll have some questions? Right. Hello, so um, I'm very happy to present John Duncan for the talk that's sponsored by the Spanish Society of Experimental Psychology, CEPEX. Um, it's a great honor to have you here, John. Uh, John, uh, let, let me do just a brief introduction, although uh, like uh, in many other cases, this is uh, probably not uh, that necessary, but just, uh, just for those of you who'd like to fill in the details, and just give a few very important uh, aspects of his career. I mean, he, he he spent uh, uh, an extraordinarily fruitful career at the Medical Research Council. He holds joint appointments now at, uh, both at Cambridge and Oxford. Um, in, on the one hand, he's the leader of the program of Brain Mechanisms of Attention Control at the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at Cambridge. Uh, at Oxford, he's a professorial research fellow in the Department of Experimental Psychology. So, um, in addition, he's been elected fellow of the Royal Society in 2008 and of the British Academy in 2009. Um, he's, he's very well known uh, for his ability to communicate outside science, although um, here we're among scientists, among psychological scientists, um, a lot of his work and recognition also stems from his ability to go beyond these walls and popularize and communicate science to the wider public, which nowadays is of extreme importance. A lot of his work is summarized in a very uh, well-known popular science book called How Intelligence Happens that was published in 2010. And it's probably for this and for some other defining features that he was awarded the Heineken Prize for Cognitive Science in 2012. Um, and, for, and for an additional thing, which is probably what, uh, what we will probably hear, be hearing most from today, which is the ability to integrate innovative and multidisciplinary research. Um, he, he looks into the relationships between psychology, behavior, intelligence on one hand with neural processes on the other. Um, in his own words, his work can be seen as combining areas as diverse as cognitive psychology, neuropsychology, neuroimaging, single cell physiology together to address the problems of attention, intelligence, and cognitive control. Um, in his talk today, he's promised to use data from all these various research approaches in order to analyze how frontal and parietal activity is associated with attention and problem solving in complex tasks, uh, which sounds like a very interesting talk. We're looking forward to very much, John. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and, of course, for the invitation to be here. Um, let me accompany those initial things, thanks also with uh, an initial apology um, to the ESCOP side of, of, of this meeting. Uh, those of you who were unfortunate enough to hear me um, giving a very similar lecture at, at, um, es at the ESCOP meeting in Cyprus um, last September uh, may find overlapping material today. The sad fact is that I haven't had very many new ideas since last September. Um, I've tried to put in a few uh, different experiments and new experiments to um, keep you entertained, but uh, there will be substantial overlap. Um, I also have a tendency to wander around and then I might not be by the microphone, so if you stop being able to hear me, please will you be as um, vocal as you need to be to interrupt my flow and bring me back because I don't really crave um, standing speaking apparently silently to you without realizing what I'm doing. Um, so let me begin with uh, this slide, which uh, sort of defines, this is a talk in part about a particular brain system and what it might contribute to cognition. Uh, and here is my summary of, of this system. Um, given various different names, I call it um, multiple demand or MD system. Uh, and I'll explain to you why I do that. This, I think, is the the existence of this system in the brain is one of the core sort of most unexpected dis initially discoveries of the brain imaging enterprise. Um, and it is that the design an imaging experiment to look at different kinds of cognitive demand, it might be language or memory or perception or response selection. Generally, you'll find, along with um, 
content specific system, systems of, uh, or patterns of activity associated with that demand, that as you increase almost any kind of demand, you get this quite characteristic pattern of joint activity in regions of frontal and parietal cortex, including on the lateral surface of parietal cortex, this sort of upside down V shape going from um, dorsal premotor cortex, this is the inferior frontal junction down, this is buried in the lateral fissure, the anterior part of the insula, and along here, uh, the cortex to either side of the inferior frontal sulcus. On the medial side of the dorsal frontal lobe, you have this activity spreading from the dorsal anterior cingulate up to the pre-supplementary motor area, accompanied by this band of activity along the intraparietal sulcus. At least in visual tasks, you usually get this higher visual activity as well, but what I'm talking about today is this frontoparietal network. And since this is part of the brain's response to solving almost any kind of cognitive challenge, generally seen if you compare a more difficult with a less difficult version of the same task, this is why I call it the multiple demand or MD system. And its presence there as part of the brain's solution to many different problems suggests that whatever it is, it's something important. It's something that we are engaging all the time to organize our activity. And here's a bit more evidence that it's something important. Um, tests of this sort are often called tests of general intelligence or fluid intelligence in psychometrics. Simple problem-solving tasks, in this case what you're supposed to do is choose which of the response alternatives would complete the matrix. And those tests are important because of their broad predictive ability. If you, the success on a test of this sort is reasonably predictive of success on all kinds of other cognitive tests and also uh, achievements of everyday life. Again, implying that whatever it is in cognitive terms is measured in this sort of problem solving. It's something of very general significance in the way that we orchestrate our behavior. And if you use brain imaging to ask what activity pattern is associated with solving problems of this sort compared, say, with simple sensory motor controls, then you end up with a picture that's more or less indistinguishable from this multiple demand picture that you get simply by averaging the difficulty effects across many different tasks. So one part of, one way to look at what I'm talking about today is what it is that this multiple demand system is contributing to cognition. And here is the um, sort of a functional suggestion that I would like to put forward. And it derives from the thought, the obvious thought, that all day, every day, what we do is to solve our complex problems by breaking them down into simpler parts and thus producing a complex structure uh, and uh, going through one part after another until by concatenating our solution to all these simple problems, we end up uh, solving the more complex problem that we were originally interested in. And if you think about any of your behavior at any time, this is what you're doing all the time. Just imagine what, or the structure of operations that you've had to assemble to begin with your initial intention to attend psychonomics and to end up with sitting in a particular seat with eyes forward listening to me. So you might think of this as taking something complicated and dividing it into this structure of attentional episodes, if you like, of series of, of cognitive fragments where we solve some, many simpler things and put them together to achieve our complex goals. There are many reasons why it has to be this way. Uh, I tend to illustrate it, um, in computational terms at least, with the following example. You can't think, I want to go to Granada. Okay, what do I do with my left hand? The reason you can't solve that problem is because there simply aren't enough constraints from your initial broad statement of the complicated problem in order to tell you what to do with your left hand. But you can set the sub-goal of flying, sub-goal of buying a ticket, sub-goal of logging into the internet, and now if your laptop is in front of you, you can know what to do with your left hand. Um, so this is why it has to be. Complex problems generally can't be solved in a single one-shot move. They have to be solved by dividing them down into simpler parts that then are sufficiently constrained for you to be able to figure out a solution. This is something that was worked on quite a lot in symbolic AI from the first work of Newell, Newell Shaw, and Simon onwards. But one example I quite like is this one from Sakadoti in 1974 because it links so well to the um, traditional clinical deficits associated with damage to the frontal lobes. So in Sakadoti's, uh, he's writing the control program for an early robot. This is um, back 40 years ago now. Uh, this robot inhabited a world of rooms and objects within the rooms. And as typical in problem-solving programs, it was given a start state. Here it is. This, this is the robot in this room at the beginning. These two objects in this room are positioned in a certain way. And it's given a goal state. And it has to work out how it will get from the start state to this goal state where these two objects have been pushed together and it's ended up in this room over here. And Sakadoti produced, con contrasted really two architectures for, 
for producing a control program for this robot. In the first one, there was no tendency to break it down by goals and sub-goals into simpler problems. So this, if you like, was a, a, a problem, a, a, um, a program that was trying to solve the problem in exactly the way I just said it can't be done by saying, I want to go to Granada, what do I do with my left hand? Here it would consider things like, this is my start state, this is my goal work state, which way should I turn my wheels first? And this is its path through the space of possible states in this environment, and uh, never mind what the exact axes are, but you can get the sense that it explores an enormous chaotic variety of possible states that it goes through, it does finally end up in the goal state, but only after this mess of, of, um, of going all over the place before it gets there. In version two, the software is, is organized so that it does indeed uh, organize each state by setting some, some um, sub-goal state, solving that problem, and then moving on to the next. And as Sakadoti says, it's as if the problem, the program, instead of one complicated problem, is given a series of simpler ones, each of which it solves very neatly, and you go nicely straight from the beginning state to the goal state. And if you read the literature on frontal lobe patients, of course, this sounds very familiar, where people say that frontal lobe patients will often do very well in a setting that's relatively constrained, such as a neuropsychological test, where there aren't that many options of things they might do. So you test them, they seem fine, you send them back home, and in the outside world, it's hopeless. You know, they can't organize their jobs, their family lives, and so on. With many more options to deal with simultaneously, you end up with this sort of chaotic rushing around everywhere, but not really being focused to get towards the end. So this is my core proposal, that the essential function of the multiple demand system is to solve this problem of taking things that are complicated and solving them by breaking them down into simpler uh, parts or attentional episodes or cognitive fragments. Uh, and that this is very close to what it is, the, the core thing that we're measuring in fluid intelligence tests, helping to explain why it is that they are so broadly predictive of success in whatever activity it is that you're trying to undertake. I'm going to talk, uh, present three sort of lots of experiments that bear on this uh, um, general line of thinking. The first are behavioral experiments having to do with this idea of what the core cognitive process may be in fluid intelligence tests and trying to uh, emphasize this point of breaking something complicated into simple parts. Then I'll talk about some neurophysiological experiments, looking at single cell recording in the um, frontal lobe of behaving monkeys and seeing um, what neural activity patterns look like as the animal navigates its way through the successive stages of complex behavior with a contrast with what happens in sort of typical simpler tasks often used in neurophysiological experiments. And then finally, I'll do, present some fMRI data also dealing with this question of complexity and fluid intelligence, but now not just in the frontal lobe as we do in the monkey, but across the whole multiple demand or ND system. And just a little bit of a warning. You can probably tell from what I have um, said already that this is a talk about complex tasks. So these tasks are going to be complex. Uh, when, you, when I describe them to you and when you look at the rules, you're going to think, whoa. Um, but pay attention, otherwise you won't, know, um, you won't know what we're all talking about. So I'm going to begin with um, some behavior, a couple of behavioral experiments. And the first one has to do with these traditional problem-solving matrix tasks that are used as standard measures of fluid intelligence. Um, and I think one of the things that's been quite characteristic, there's been a lot of work in trying to understand core cognitive mechanisms in tests of this sort, because we know that whatever it is, it's something important. And a very natural move, and a move that's been followed a lot, is to essentially focus on relationships between these relatively complex multi-step problem-solving tasks and much simpler tasks of the sort that we like in the cognitive psychology laboratory, such as simple tests of short-term memory or reaction time and so on. Uh, and though this may not be in the entirely uh, the wrong thing to do, uh, what I want to try and persuade you of today is that we've slightly thrown the baby out with the bathwater in doing that, because it's the very complexity of, the t of these tests that makes them tests of fluid intelligence, that makes them broadly predictive of success in, in uh, other things, um, or gives them that property most strongly, perhaps, I would say. So you can see that this is a complex multi-part task, and to solve it, you're going to have to have thought of something along the following lines. There's variation in shape, so I better pick a circle. There's variation in color, there's variation in size, and when you've got all the solutions to all those three different parts, you've got to integrate them, and eventually, if you do that, you'll end up with the right answer. And unless you go through some, unless you consider each of those separate parts, then you're, not going, you're going to pick one of the alternatives that's right in some respects, but wrong in others. 
So already it's clear that a task of this sort has this element of starting with something relatively complicated and finding a way to focus attention on the simple parts of it. That once you're thinking, for example, about shape, it's immediately obvious the answer is going to be a circle. But you have to get to that point of dividing it into parts. And I am suggesting that this really is the core thing that, that makes this gives this task its properties. But there's another thing that's also probably been emphasized more in the literature, and that has to do with working memory demand. To solve this problem, not only do you have to focus on, in this case, three different parts of it, but you have to then bear your sol solutions to all these different parts in mind, combine them, and only when you put them all together at once can you end up knowing that this is the correct answer. And as I say, probably it's more popular to think that what's really li limited here, what this is really a measure of, is working memory capacity um, as you keep all these partial results in mind and finally integrate them. So what we tried to do in this first experiment is pr to produce a version of this task in which we minimize or essentially remove um, the working memory integration element and just leave the breaking it into parts, the focused attention element. And we were predicting that nevertheless, people who do badly on conventional fluid intelligence tests would still have massive problems with the new versions of this test that we created. So the way that we did it was, is like this. Um, again, it's a matrix problem, and you're, gonna ha you're supposed to work out what, the, what answer would complete the missing spot. This time, the items in the matrix are always made up of three separable parts, spatially separate parts. Uh, and to remove the need to bear the answers in working memory and integrate them, we just ask people to draw the answer in this response box at the bottom. So, for example, you might focus on the part on the right, decide it should be curved, draw it in. Focus on the top, decide it should be black, draw it in. Um, sorry. And focus on the bit on the left, decide it should be kinked, draw it in, and you've got the answer. So this time, all the end is really, once you have focused attention on one part after another, everything else is trivial, and yet we still expected that people with poor fluid intelligence scores would have great problems with them. So we gave this task, this new set of uh, matrix problems, to a group of people and also gave them a standard um, test of fluid intelligence. It's called Cattell's Culture Fair. Never mind exactly what it is. It's one of these standard problem-solving tests. And look at the relationship between the two. Um, and here are the results. Um, people have been... Um, well, the scatter plot shows that each, per each dot here is a person. Uh, this shows the probability correct on a new task. People were given 30 seconds to solve each problem. This is their performance on the standard culture fair test, translated into an IQ, so mean of 100, standard deviation in the normal population of 16 on this particular test. And you can find that people who do well on the culture fair test also do very well on our new task. People who do badly on the culture fair, down in the region of um, IQs of 100 and below, start to do very badly. And some people who just really can't solve the problem that we're giving them, even though the working memory and integration part seems not to be important. Our claim is that the task is essentially trivial once you've achieved focused attention on the parts. So in order to see whether this was true, we produced another version of it. So now there are other problems of the exact same structure, but now the focused attention part is done for you because the three different parts are shown to you in three different matrices. But again, you're supposed to look at the one on the left, decide the answer should be curved, draw it in. Look at the one in the middle, decide it should be black, draw it in. Look at the one on the right, decide that it should be kinked, draw it in. So the same set of things that you had to go through, but now with this breaking it into parts done for you. What we expected now is that this would be trivial for everybody. In fact, you can probably immediately see it is trivial for everybody, and the data show the same thing. Now, these are the same people, with red being the separated condition I've just shown you, and all these people who before were really struggling to solve the problem correctly um, are now close to perfect as well. So I think this term is, uh, kind of supports the idea that what you're really, the core thing in these traditional matrix problems has to do with this activity of taking something complicated and finding the simple parts within it, the things that can easily be solved. And, and um, once that is done for you, even people who really struggle with something complicated can do it perfectly well. Second experiment to make the same, I'm going to come at the same point, but from a different point. Uh, a different angle. Um, uh, one thing that's uh, been known for the many years now, 20 years or more, to be closely related to fluid intelligence is a difficulty in the process of translating new task instructions into the right pattern of behavior. And in some cases, at least, you can find something that I've called goal neglect, also seen in frontal lobe patients, 
where the person knows perfectly well what the rules of the task are, then they complete the whole task as if some of those rules didn't exist. It's kind of bizarre and striking when you see it, but it's not that hard to find if tasks are reasonably complicated. The person tells you what they should do, and then they complete the whole task just as if that neither you nor they had ever spoken, basically. Um, and as I say, this is not only seen in frontal lobe patients, but it's quite restricted to people in the lower end of the fluid intelligence distribution, so that, again, it seems that whatever you're is causing this goal neglect type of problem is something closely related to what it is you're measuring with tests like um, the Cattell Culture Fair or Ravens matrices. We know based on previous work that the complexity of the set of rules in the task is important. You get this kind of difficulty or goal neglect much more strongly as you add more and more rules to the task. And rather interestingly, it's the total body of rules that you give the person that matters. It doesn't matter if they know that even for a whole current block of trials, some of the rules won't apply. It's nothing to do with struggling to actually apply them. It's to do with the whole body that they are selecting from. And what we have proposed is that this, again, is a problem similar to the one that I've been describing, that as you go through any complex task, at any given moment, you've got to make sure that the right rules are active and controlling what you're, what you're doing, and everything else is momentarily left in the background. So there has to be this act of selectively picking forward what matters now and leaving behind all the other stuff that is there in the task but doesn't matter right now. And our suggestion is that people with low fluid intelligence can often struggle with this so that as the total body of rules becomes bigger, the selection or search problem becomes worse, then it's harder for them to find the right rule for each step of behavior. So now I'm going to go through one of these very complicated tasks in an experiment that confirms that this is the, this is the problem that we're dealing with. Um, let's focus first on just one half of it, A. So this is the vehicles task. And um, here are some example uh, stimuli, stimulus screens, and here are the rules which actually look a bit blurred to me at least, but um, it doesn't really matter if you know exactly what the rules are, you'll be able to get the principles at least. So in this experiment, we presented this, this vehicles task, as I call it, in three different forms. So between subject design, different people get these three different forms. In the simple form, each trial looks like this. There's this little um, display of the letters and symbols, and the rules are shown down here, and I call these the response decision rules, and these are the only rules that we care about. These are the ones we're going to score, um, and uh, the rest of it is, is not going to influence the performance measures that I show you. And the decision rule for this is that you should touch, it's a touch screen, you touch the lowercase letter, unless immediately down here there is a dot rather than a triangle, in which case you touch the dot instead. So it's already reasonably complicated, but um, this is the simplest version of the task that we use. In the complex version, it's exactly the same, except before you get to these response selection rules, we add some navigation rules which tell you which of these four panels to work on. Uh, and that's um, shown down here. The rule for this one is if, it, if this is a minus, go to the left. If it's a plus, go to the right. On each side, there's a car and a bicycle, go to the bicycle. And then once you've got to that point, you switch to the response selection rules and do what you were doing in the simple version. So we know, because we asked before and after the experiment, that people know all these rules. And if you manage just to focus on the response selection component once you had got to here, that it should be just as easy to do it as it was over there. But because of previous results, we expected this would not be true, that especially people of low fluid intelligence would struggle with the response selection rules when they'd got this earlier navigation process to go through. And then the critical, so that, a difference between these two would be a replication of previous results. The critical manipulation comes here, where we produce a third task version called, we call stepped, where all the same rules as in the complex version are still in op operation. The person still got to have all those in working memory and select the, the right rules at the right time. But we make it easier to focus on this in separate steps by presenting first a display like this, getting them to touch the say, correct panel, which here would be the bike. Then when they do that, this display disappears, this one comes up, and now they go through the response selection rules in the same way that they do in the simple form. And our prediction is that in this case, um, the errors produced by, adding, by increasing task complexity will be reduced or eliminated, making it more easy to go, to go back to the same level of, of performance we had in the simple version, where these extra navigation rules didn't exist at all. Um, in point of fact, this isn't quite, this was an unspeeded task. People have as much, well, they actually have a maximum of 20 seconds, but they never get close to that. So in order to produce errors in, the, in a task, you need quite a bit of complexity. Uh, and in fact, this isn't enough. Um, as we knew from previous results. So what really happened was that there was one set of trials like this, 
Another set of trials with essentially the same structure, but different rules involving different symbols and pictures of books that were open or closed. And the, all the rules were present, described at the beginning together, and then they have random sequence of trials of these two, two sorts mixed together, uh, mixed together. But the form was the same for both tasks in any given subject. They're either both simple, both complex, or both stepped. Um, sorry, that's a rather a complicated way to get to rather simple um, results, and here are the simple results. So now here are the proportion of correct, remember, only on those response selection rules that are common to all forms of the task. In the simple form, um, oh, sorry, the, se the separation between regular and modified trials. The regular trials are like on most of them, where you touch the lowercase letter. The modified are where you take on this extra rule, where it, un unless there's a dot, in which case touch the dot instead. Uh, we, we did this initially because we thought they might be differentially sensitive to load, but they're not. So the results for the two look similar. So in the simple task forms, it sounded complicated to you, but actually for almost everybody, performance is closed and is 95% correct or more. So people really can do this pretty easily when they've only got the simple task to do. In the complex form, we're only scoring the response rules, and they know what the response rules are. So if they focus just on this at that moment of the task, there'd be no reason for it to be anything different from what, how it is in the simple form, but it is. Um, people find quite a bit more difficulty with, do, with um, doing the response selection correctly when they've had to do this navigation step first. And the stepped form goes right back to the level of accuracy you have in the simple form. So this extra cue that makes it easier to break the overall requirements of the task up into separate parts very much ameliorates the difficulties of dealing with increased task complexity. And if you look down here at the scatter plot of proportion correct against culture fair IQ again, then you you see, again, it's in the complex condition. It's these people at the lower end of the fluid intelligence distribution who have trouble with this focus on the right thing at the right time. They know what they should be doing, but somehow they fail to retrieve just that right thing when it's in a more complex context. And yet, if you make it easier for them by breaking it into separate parts in the step, then people, then even people with low scores here can do perfectly well. Um, so this is the first, the behavioral part of, of, my, of my talk. And, um, encourages this idea that a task complexity is important in measuring in measurements of fluid intelligence and that the core aspect of that is this process of taking something complicated and finding a way to divide it into simple solvable parts um, I often feel my role in psychology is to fight a vigorous defense of what's completely obvious uh, and I think if you think about what's going on in, ta in a task like those matrices what else would you say other than what I have just said um, but um, that's okay. <laughs> Just because it's obvious, it doesn't mean that it's not true. Um, <laughs> so as I say, I think this is the core cognitive process that's measured in fluid intelligence tests. I think that in everything that we do all day, every day, there is this essential requirement to take our overall um, goals or complex problems and divide them into simple parts, and that this helps to explain why it is that fluid intelligence tests, which focus with their little level of complexity on, um, on this process, are so predictive of how successfully we do almost anything else it is that we're given to do. You know, um, let me not go into exactly how predictive they are, because of course there are tons of other variables that also influence performance in anything that we do. But this is something important and influences many different things. Um, right, so that's enough for the cognitive psychology. The next step is going to be neurophysiology and I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the um, responses of frontal lobe neurons, as I say, as an animal conducts its way through a reasonably complicated structure of goal-directed behavior. And just to contrast what we're doing, I'm going to begin with this slide here um, from uh, sort of classic work of the Goldman or Keech group in the, in the 1980s. And the sorts of findings that um, stamped into the field the idea that sustained activity in cells of prefrontal cortex is uh, a core aspect of working memory and is important in the way that we carry information forward from one moment to another to conduct our, to conduct our behavior. Uh, this is a classical delayed saccad task. What happens in this task is that the animal begins fixating in the center. Then one of these positions, around, eight positions around the periphery is flashed. At this moment, he has to do nothing. He waits until he gets a release cue and then has to make a saccad to the location where the flash occurred. And this shows um, responses. The uh, uh, figure comes from almost any textbook of frontal lobe neurophysiology and working memory. Uh, the responses of an example neuron for um, 
stimuli flashed in the eight different positions around the circle. The flash occurs between these two vertical bars. This is the delay period when he's not allowed to move, and then this is the go signal, which allows him to, if you like, retrieve the stimulated location from working memory and make a saccade to it. And this is, as I say, a conventional classical neuron that um, begins to fire for a flash in a certain location. They're not always as tightly tuned as this, but this one's very tuned, sustains its activity through the delay period, and then after the monkey has used the information and made its response, the activity goes away. So we are going to look, um, and we've only just begun looking really, um, so I'm going to give you very preliminary results from an experiment that's not finished yet. Um, but we start, wanted to look at how, how this um, spatial working memory pattern would, would um, stack up when you give the task some more complex hierarchical structure in it. Um, and again, the task is reasonably complicated and does have some hierarchical structure in it, so let's take a minute or two to go through it. Um, and each session, the monkey would solve uh, a whole series of problems, usually many problems in a given session, based on this um, set of five location markers on a screen. And in each problem, um, he again responds by reaching out and touching the screen, the same as our he human subjects were doing in the last experiment. Uh, and in, in each problem, two of these locations are associated with reward. When the monkey touches those, he'll get a drop of fruit smoothie, which he really loves. Uh, the other three locations are not. So his task is to find out for each problem what the two rewarded locations are and then to revisit them through a series of trials. Um, and because they could learn these problems very quickly, as I say, we were able to get through many problems of this general sort within a session and then we'd be recording with a battery of our electrodes the activity of many frontal neurons simultaneously as the monkey goes through one task, one problem or an, uh, after another of a long, perhaps uh, three hour recording session, something of that sort. Each problem actually consisted of four cycles. Cycle one we call the explore cycle because here he doesn't know where the rewards are, so he has to explore around until he finds them. Cycles two to four are called the, we call the exploit cycles because now he's found them on cycle one and all he has to do is to retouch the locations that he should know in working memory are the ones that were associated with reward on when he explored. Um, here go the typical, each cycle has several trials. This is, might be a typical sequence of trials for the explore cycle. On trial one, he samples this location. He gets no reward. The green circles, of course, are for you. The monkey doesn't have the green circles. Um, trial two, he tries one of the ones that's associated with reward and he gets his reward, so now he should know that this goes into working memory. Uh, trial three, again, he samples one of the no unrewarded locations. This is just to show you that on trial four, if he goes back to the one he already took on this cycle, the reward's not there anymore, so he should know not to go back to ones he's already harvested. And then finally, the cycle ends when he finds the second reward. He knows there are only two rewards, so as soon as he finds two in this search, however he searched for them, then he knows the cycle is over and he goes on to the exploit cycle. And then finally, um, again, with another aspect of hierarchical structure, each single trial is broken down into a sequence of events uh, typical in neurophysiology so that you can separate neural uh, responses or neural activity related to um, different aspects of the, of the performance. Uh, begins with a fixation period and he's holding a start key. He has to wait until there's a go signal and then he re releases the start key, reaches out and touches one of the locations. He has to hold the location for um, 0.4 seconds, then gets a feedback signal, either red or green, telling him this was either correct or incorrect. And then after another 0.4 seconds, he either gets no reward in this case because it was the wrong location or he gets his squirt of fruit smoothie because it was, one of the, it was the correct location. Uh, we also have manipulated the complexity by having blocked within the session problems with two target locations to learn, as I've shown you here, or problems with just a single target location. So as soon as he finds one, he goes on to the next cycle. We've also done some now with three target problems, but I'm not going to show you about those today. The so first, uh, well, here, this is an um, illustration on MRI of the recording locations. Um, it's probably not that visible to those of you who aren't frontal lobe neurophysiologists, um, but th this is um, the principal sulcus, that is, the, the go runs along the, the, the middle of the lateral surface of the monkey's uh, frontal lobe, a very good candidate for being the uh, monkey's equivalent of our uh, uh, lateral frontal strip of activity in the multiple demand system. 
In fact, I'm not going to talk about this today, but from um, experiments measuring functional connectivity at rest, we've got pretty good reason to think that this is an, a part of a monkey multiple demand system. And then these are the, the simultaneous um, recording array locations. So you have a whole battery of semi-chronic electrodes recording neurons simultaneously during a given session. Question one, <coughs> excuse me. Um, how much spatial information do we find? That is, uh, so what we're going to do, obviously, is to do the same thing that Funahashi, Bruce, and Goldman Rakic did, that is look at selective um, responses to spatial location, but now in this more complex overall setting. Are we getting selective responses to, uh, according to which, which location the monkey chooses to visit on any given trial? Um, so here, to begin with, I'm just going to show you the activity around this first fixation period. And he's holding his eyes in the middle, he's holding his hand on the key, but he can, of course, have already decided which location he's going to try out on this, on this trial. Uh, and in fact, the data I'm going to show you about from, uh, on this slide come only from the exploit cycles. So this is cycles where he knows perfectly well where the targets are, and we are um, going to look at spatial coding. And here are response profiles for four different example neurons. Um, so the outer line, the, the, we're showing activity in a polar plot in terms of spikes per second of response in this, uh, in this early uh, period of the trial when he's may have decided what to do. Uh, this is a neuron that fires most strongly for this fourth position here and rather less, rather less for um, the position on the opposite side. Here's one that fires, fires more strongly in the third position. Uh, here's quite a tightly tuned one that fires most strongly for the top position and so on. Um, it's hard to uh, give you an overall scale of how widespread this activity is in prefrontal cortex. Over here, uh, um, I'm showing you something, uh, one version of one way to look at this, um, which is derived by doing an ANOVA on each individual cell. And then um, we, you, we've got a measure here of the amount of variance explained in that single cell's activity by spatial location and taking out, in other words, along with also the effects of variability over trials, which is always massive, uh, cycle, and so on. And though this number in itself, in absolute terms, won't mean much to you, you um, this will be useful in other slides for comparing with other task conditions. You just see this rather sustained um, uh, level of coding of, front, of, um, of um, spatial information within, the, within the, um, this frontal lobe population. And to give you some sense of it, this sort of level of a, a, a value of about 1% explained variance corresponds to around about 20% overall of individual cells having a significant effect of location. So even though we're not selecting these cells for their location sensitivity or properties particularly, around about 20% of them tend to have, have significant spatial information at this part of the trial. So with that as the background, let's ask a couple of questions about how this um, evolves during the course of activity. Uh, obviously, where, um, what you do, and as, you, uh, well, as you imagine, the, say the sequence of operations that you go through to get your way to the chair that you're sitting in right now, it appears slightly implausible that the whole structure Surround, which is uh, for solving the problem of coming here and listening to me, is in a sense neurally active at the moment that you do some particular things such as selecting your chair or picking, up, picking your book out to start writing notes and so on. It seems instead that much of that structure must be relatively latent with the active parts brought into control of behavior at the moment that they're needed. Um, that may be, you might contrast that with what you predict from the sort of sustained activity working memory model that would come from Funahashi et al, where you might imagine that when the monkey finds his, his target locations on that first explore cycle, then he would get sustained activity reflecting that that's an important location all the way through until he's finished exploiting it in the subsequent cycles. So which of those two do we really get? Well, we get a picture much more of one step at a time and here's one way that we can look at that. We can ask for each cell, and this, again, we're looking at the same period of the trial in cycles two to four. We can ask for each cell, how much information is there about the chosen location on this trial, that is the one the monkey is going to touch and get his reward for. He's nearly always getting a reward now because he knows the answer. And how much information is there about the other target that he's also got in working memory, obviously, because he's going to visit it on the next trial. Um, so if there was sustained activity, you should also be able to decode what the other location in working memory is. But on the other hand, if it's, if it's much more this alternation between control by different things, you might not find much uh, coding of what the other location he's got in working memory is. 
And uh, it's very much the second of those pictures, the latent picture that's shown here. Uh, these are the same four cells we had before. Uh, again, they, each polar plot shows activity as a function of the location chosen on this particular trial, but now they've been broken down according to what the other location that he's got in working memory is. Um, and you can see in various ways. Here's a cell, for example, that really likes location one when he's choosing it on this trial. Location one, uh, I can't see this probably as well as you can, is in this sort of orangey reddy color. And now this is when he's like choosing other locations, but he's got one in working memory. And you can see that it has absolutely no impact on, on neural activity. Uh, and that's this summary in terms of variance accounted for shows a very similar picture. This is the same figure you showed before, showing how much var variance is accounted for by the location chosen on this trial. This much smaller figure is how much variance is accounted for by the other location in working memory. So while the animal is selecting one, the other one is largely latent. Somehow it's held there, but it's not held in sustained firing patterns in prefrontal cortex. Uh, and I'm going to show you one more thing from this task, which um, makes a related point, but it's um, now dealing not with the move from one trial to another, but the, with the move from one phase to another of the, of the overall cognitive activity. So to do this, I'm going to move to a different part of the uh, trial and uh, a different place where you might be looking at spatial coding. Before, we were looking at the beginning of the trial when he decides to reach out and touch a certain location. Now I'm going to show you what happens on cycle one when he has this, gets this feedback telling him either this is the target location or it's the non-target location. So this is a very important event for him on cycle one. This is where he learns whether this is a location to put into working memory and revisit, or it's a location that's not associated with reward and he shouldn't come back here ever, uh, well, at least not till the end of the current problem. So spatial information is very important. And again, we find a lot of spatial selectivity, stronger than it was in the previous phase, of the, in the other phase I was telling you about, in fact. So here again are individual cells showing spatial selectivity. Um, and this time, blue is for cycle one, which is um, the, the stage of the trial where this information really matters. Um, this yellowy orange is for the exploit cycles, where he's getting feedback still and reward, but it's not telling him anything because he already knows whether this, these are whether this is a target, that these are target locations. Um, and you can see much more strong coding in these example cells of spatial location when it matters, when it's, being, when it's telling him something he needs to know, than when it's just confirming what he already knows. And that's confirmed over here in these, again, plots of uh, the omega squared value, of variance accounted for value, that in cycle one, there's much more activity than there is in cycles two to four. And also, this is an interesting distinction that we're still following up. Uh, between, on cycle one, um, he finds two successive targets in turn, sometimes with other non-target locations touched between them. You get much more spatial information coding for the first one than you do for the second one. People often think about, well, again, we're, we're seeing an effect of complexity. People often think about a neural medium as having, as um, being limited in capacity. So if it's what, dealing with one thing, um, other, other uh, aspects of the task can run into trouble. And maybe we're seeing a bit of a reflection of this here as well, that in the cycle one activity, it's much, there's much more information for the first one than there is when you've already got that rule in mind and now you're having to learn a second rule down here. As I say, we're following up further with that, but it's a preliminary interesting suggestion. So now we can compare the spatial selectivity of given neurons at these two phases of the trial, which correspond to very different cognitive operations. Here, we're looking at the process of learning that this is a rewarded location and entering it into working memory. In the data I showed you before, uh, it's more like a retrieval phase of, of, of deciding that this is what, of remembering that this is one of the re rewarded locations and deciding to reach out and touch it. Um, and we, think that we thought it would be interesting to look at the spatial coding of single cells in these two different phases of the trial. Again, if you thought of a simple sustained activity model, they should be the same. The same cell should be act become active when you learn that this location is a target and later on when you reach out and touch it. But it's nothing like that. Um, in fact, the, uh, here are four example cells where we've got um, the, the polar plot showing selectivity in the um, fixation phase in cycles two to four, or the choice phase, should we make say, and the feedback uh, phase of cycle one. And looking at these examples, you see almost no relationship between spatial selectivity and these two different parts of the trial. And in fact, if you, uh, across the whole set of recorded cells, if you correlate 
the direction of preference in these two um, test phases, you find a correlation close to zero. So what this suggests, as I say, the cognitive operations that are being controlled at these two different phases of the task are completely different from one another. If you imagine as a cognitive psychologist writing down a task analysis, you'd be writing very different things for these stages of the trial. And it seems that indeed in prefrontal cortex, rather separate independent control structures are built for those different phases of the, of the uh, overall sequence of behavior. And that a given neuron can be taking on quite different roles in, say, the feedback phase, the entry into working memory, phase, or the learning phase, and later on in the retrieval phase. Uh, much more to be done on this in, in establishing the idea of separate neural coalitions, if you like, for locations in the different types of, co of cognitive operation. But already we can see that it's something much more complicated than the simple sustained activity model going on here. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm doing well. So as I say, um, this, uh, once you look at tasks with a bit more complex structure to them and prefrontal cortex, you get something that goes well beyond the traditional idea of sustained activity as being at the uh, sustained working memory activity being at the core of what the frontal lobe neurophysiology is about. Instead, you find evidence of this very, very flexible neural resource that switches back and forth. Information is switched in and out according to what it is. It's the content of the current cognitive fragment, if you like. Um, we get this very strong evidence of focus. That is, even though we know that multiple fragments must be somehow there in the overall task plan, that most of them are latent. It's only the, the one that's currently the focus of, of attention or behavior that is, that's decodable from the uh, neurophysiological activity. And this last point, as I say, that as you go through uh, the steps of a task, which require different kinds of cognitive operation, it appears that even single cells can take on quite different roles as you can build the control structure for that bit of the task. Right, deep breath. Uh, there's one more thing that I want to go through. This shouldn't take very long, so I still hope there might be a bit of time for questions at the end. Um, but now I want to return to this question, again, of novel instructions and complexity, um, but now using fMRI to look at activity throughout, not just in lateral frontal cortex, as we've done in this monkey experiment. Actually, in this experiment, we also have a whole load of parietal lobe recordings, but I haven't um, told you about those today. Uh, the bottom line is that so far, the parietal activity looks extremely similar to the frontal lobe activity, but, but um, more on that to follow, perhaps. Um, but now we want to look across the whole multiple demand system simultaneously and to look at how the system is able to pick out the most important or task critical events uh, as, a varia as a function, again, a variation in the overall complexity of what it is that you have to do. And also we're going to look again at fluid intelligence in this experiment. Um, so as I say, deep breath while you take on board another somewhat complicated task. Uh, in this task, you go, it went in little chunks of 30 seconds of behavior. Each chunk begins with a cue which tells you which target object you're looking for. Then you get a series of pictures at one per second, and every time you see a target, you press a button, otherwise you do nothing. Uh, and here's our manipulation of complexity. In one version, there were just two rules to be learned, which is this cue means the chair, uh, this cue means the elephant. Um, and actually, within each chunk, there would always be two instances of the target you're looking for and the other target that you're not looking for on this chunk, but you will be doing in a, in a, uh, 30 seconds later when you change to the other task. Uh, this is the two-rule version. There was also a four-rule version where you learned four of these rules, though these two, again, are the ones that we're, looking, that we're interested in, in, in a way I'll explain in a second. So as I say, here would be a typical scanning run. <coughs> Last four four minutes or so, I suppose. Um, and it works like this. There are a series of chunks for the two main rules. So each of these is 30 seconds, two little blocks of them. Um, so, so here it might go A, B, B, A. Then there's a little pause, and then up it goes again, B, A, B, A. <coughs> That's in the two, two rule condition. The four rule condition is exactly the same, except at the beginning of each half, the other two rules are used once. So while we're recording data, which is in these sections here, people know perfectly well what it is they should be doing and which cue it, it is they've got and what they're looking for. Their behavior, as you'll see, is not perfect, but close to perfect. Um, and yet, in the co more complex case, there are these additional rules in the overall task model, if you like, which aren't operative right now, but which, uh, whose effects we're interested in looking at. In terms of behavior, um, 
it's kind of as what we expected, um, but now not at all in the context of goal neglect. We're not getting any of these dramatic failures to obey any of the rules. Everybody is close to perfect. But still, there is this interaction between complexity and IQ. Again, IQ here is measured with the standard Cattell culture fair, and people are just sorted by median split into high IQ and low IQ bins. And even though everybody is really very good indeed, um, what we're scoring here are misses of targets and false alarms to those um, lures, if you like, the items that aren't a target on this, in this chunk, but they will be a target in other chunks. So we combine those two into a single error score. Um, and you find that indeed it's true that there's somewhat more failure in the low IQ person, but only as task complexity goes up. And now what we're um, going to do is to use fMRI to ask what happens to activity in the different regions of the multiple demand system in response to these critical events, both the targets and the non-targets or lures. Uh, and in this plot, what we have done is to show activity in response to targets in the um, brighter colors, non-targets in the duller colors for each of the separate a priori defined multiple demand regions um, on lateral frontal surface, parietal lobe, and medial frontal surface. And in fact, where they are doesn't matter a huge amount because the average you can see is a pretty good reflection of, um, of what you see in, each, in e every component of this multiple demand system. Um, so the big thing that you can see, well, there are two big things that you can see. Much more activity for targets than there is for non-targets. So when the important target comes along and he presses a button, you get strong activity throughout the whole multiple demand system and actually more broadly in the brain. This is far from a new discovery. Target events in a sequence of, um, in a sequence of stimuli always produce massive brain activity, including strongly in the multiple demand system. Uh, here is something more interesting. Uh, that um, You can bear the two and four rule cases significantly less response to both targets and non-targets in the four rule than in the two rule case. And so overall, even though people, as you've seen from behavior, they know exactly what they're doing and they're doing it correctly, but still the multiple demand system is less effectively giving a response to the important events when they occur, when the overall complexity of the, of the task has been increased. Um, and now we're going to, we've averaged together now the responses to targets and non-targets, and instead we're dividing the data into high and low IQ subjects, and now it looks very like behavior. So in the two-rule case, there's a nice strong response to critical events in both groups, but in the four-rule case, it's the low IQ people who are beginning to show weaker response to these task critical events in the context of a more complex overall whole. And again, my interpretation would be that now at the level of whole chunks, the... Um, we're beginning to run into a problem of having a nice, focused um, control structure that does only what's important in this chunk, and the other things that will be important in other chunks but aren't important right now are diminishing the ability to produce that selective, um, sort of task-driven activity pattern. So I'm going to finish with um, a general comment. Um, uh, not about these particular results, but about the whole enterprise of looking at the multiple demand system and, and trying to understand what it is that's going on in fluid intelligence that's so important in all the behavior that we undertake. Um, and I like, I think whether or not my solutions to this problem are right, I think it's a very good problem, and I think it's a very good problem for this reason. Um, I was basically encouraged into cognitive psychology, or at least the psychology of information processing, by reading Donald Broadbent's book, Decision and Stress, which is an extremely bold piece of work. It's published in 1971, and essentially what Broadbent did in this is to try and use some fairly simple principles, which in his case had to do with statistical decision-making, um, filtering of relevant information, and so on, and to apply those to all sorts of different domains, whether it was short-term memory or selective attention or vigilance or arousal and so on. And as an undergraduate, I just thought this was very thrilling that the complex world of cognition, which seemed infinite and diverse, could be reduced to, or you could get some purchase on it with very fairly simple principles. And then I feel that the, our, our field really let this go. As knowledge accumulated, we just go more and more into this mindset of modularity, so that if you um, read the textbook on explanation of face recognition, shall we say, and another one on story grammars, and another one on motor control, they just seem rather unrelated sections of, uh, of, um, of a different set of modules in the mind and brain. Now, maybe that's 
all the way. That's, we've had to do that for a good reason. But it seems much more attractive to me if we can also be still on the lookout for general principles which have to do with all of cognition, with all of with the structure of all of behavior. And given the, um, sort of the nature of the multiple demand system and the predictive power of fluid intelligence, this seems to me like a good place to look. So this is the reason why I am continuing to devote quite so much effort to unraveling this, unraveling this question. I'd like to be finish with my acknowledgements. Uh, for the fluid intelligence experiments, Daphne Chalinski and Danny Mitchell. Um, for the electrophysiology experiments, the team in the, in the Oxford lab, Kei Watanabe in particular, uh, and also Miki Kadahisa, Makoto Kusunoki, and my long-term collaborator, Mark Buckley. And then the fMRI is a new project just finished by the postdoc, Nadja Chencha, and again, Danny Mitchell, who's actually responsible for almost everything the good that happens in my experimental life. And I'm through. Um, thank you very much. I was told that questions aren't necessarily expected in keynote um, presentations. On the other hand, I think questions are the best part of a presentation. So if anybody would like to ask questions, we have a few minutes. Um, I'll go ahead. Just shout, it's all right. temporal abstraction and ordering really easily, right? So what I wonder is what's telling the brain, what's telling these cells, now's a good time to be doing this episode, now's a good time to do that episode. So is, are you down to a chaining model now where each episode is triggering each one or is there some other cast representation which is ordering all of those episodes themselves? Yeah, well it has to be option two, I think. It's gonna be some sort of hierarchical structure. Um, and in a way, when I answer this question, I, I always, uh, people always think, oh, he has nothing to say about this, which is true. Um, but I think the obvious answer, again, is the right answer, and it is essentially long-term memory. It's the same thing that happens in a Newell and Simon production system. The, the thing that tells you what's the right move to make next is your immense body of knowledge that bears on this particular domain, and it's very hard to imagine it could be anything else other than that, I think. Now, what mechanism actually allows you to use this knowledge to produce the useful chunks when you're doing the matrix problem to think, color's something I'm going to work on? This really is the $64,000 question, isn't it? And I don't have any answers to that question, but that's it's really the question that symbolic AI was largely was dedicated towards. How do, you, yeah, how do you begin with this vast, perhaps somewhat undifferentiated body of knowledge and use that to make useful steps forward through a problem space? I, I still think that's... That's sort of our best way of thinking about the problem. Great talk, John. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, there's really a, I wanted to comment on the, your last uh, conclusion slide there, but um, we set up a contrast between modularity, modularity as opposed to simple principles, and I, I'm not sure that they're incompatible. Uh, so you could argue that there's modularity in the brain, uh, but that each module actually works according to the same simple principles. So you could have domain-specific systems in the brain, they operate according to the same principles, uh, but you get the impression that it's a, a sort of single system, all of which uh, is, is operating the same way. Uh, or it could be that there are simple principles by which problem-solving occurs, um, and different systems break down those problems in, uh, according to those same simple principles. Yes. Sorry, I certainly didn't mean for a moment to imply that it either it's modularity or it's general. People occasionally also accuse me of being like Lashley and thinking of mass action, which <laughs> could hardly be further from the truth. Um, what I meant is that it's more to do with where the attention of the discipline is, and I feel we have got so sucked up with detailed accounts of particular things that sometimes we don't have enough attention to what the overall picture or the overall architecture ought to be. I, I mean no more than that. And of course, I'm absolutely sure it's true that there are many, many sort of essentially modular, I mean, strongly communicating with others, but essentially modular processes within the brain, of course. Um, so it would be and there's perfectly decent scientific enterprise to try and understand those down at the level of the individual details of, shall we say, striate cortex, of course. 
but I think it's also nice to be looking at the bigger picture simultaneously, that's all I'm saying. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.